the expectation and it's almost the default that um, flexible working is for working mothers, that we have a narrative as soon as you see a woman that's pregnant, you know, so people will ask, what what are you going to do about work? Are you going to give work up? And we don't have those conversations with men. So there is a, an expectation or a burden that sits on the shoulders of, of females and working mothers doesn't come into conversation with fathers in the same way. Hello, welcome back to What A Future. Uh, This week we're joined by Lizzie Martin. Lizzie is a leadership coach and consultant. She's the founder of Work Life Mother, who partner with organisations to support parent employees returning to work after parental leave. Lizzie, I'm so grateful to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me here. My pleasure, my pleasure. Now let's jump straight in. We all know the question by now. The question is, what is the biggest issue affecting the world of work right now? So the issue that I would love to focus on today is that women are still paid less than men. Women, especially mothers, are paid significantly less than men. And also we're not seeing them being progressed to senior positions as much as we are um, non-working parents and men as well. So something that doesn't get as much airtime as the gender pay gap is the motherhood penalty. And there is a 7% pay gap between mothers and non-mothers who are working full time. So that is absolutely the space that I would love to explore a bit further. Excellent. Well, dive in then. What's what's the, the sort of cause? How have we got here? Well, we still see that the women that are choosing to have children become the primary carers. Um, women these days very much are... Um, part of the sandwich generation so caring for children and also caring for the older generation um a lot of the household labor falls on their shoulders and and quite often that's because as the lower earners it makes most financial sense for them to take leave to work flexibly to stay at home but also we don't see a support system in place that encourages men to take parental leave. And a lot of those um, inequalities start at the point of a baby coming into the household. So a baby being more born. That's where that trajectory of roles um, very much starts to become established. And as women take on more of the household labour and the childcare, their participation in the workforce declines. Or what we see happening is their confidence is um, impacted. So they see a a dip in their their confidence, which means they take on roles that don't play to their skills. So a lot of women will be underemployed. So they will be doing um, jobs that provide them with the flexibility that they need, but don't maximise the skill set that they have. So we see them sort of downshifting their careers Um, either because they're not um, participating fully, they're not in full-time employment, or because they are moving into roles that aren't maximising their talents. That's interesting. So there's there's a kind of number of factors there, isn't there, I think. I've seen, you know, separately to this uh, statistic around uh, motherhood and and parenthood in, in, in general, this idea that, you know, men are much more likely, for example, to apply for a job where they don't fit the job description exactly. Than, than women are so it's almost like we've got we've got a sort of cultural issue that maybe the workplace is more set up for men than it should be and then that doubles down when mm. you then add parenthood into the mix and the societal expectations that you know women will largely be the caregivers when when that happens is that is that the sort of way you're seeing it yeah yeah and and you're I think you're referring to the um there's a quote isn't there that says that women will wait until they meet a hundred percent of the criteria to apply for a job whereas men will go with it even if they only hit 60 percent of the criteria and that's often used to say that women are less confident than men but Mm -hmm. actually when you sort of delve into it there's a McKinsey article about it it's about the fact that women follow the rules Um, so if a job um, advert says 
this is what you need to have in order to apply. It's most likely that women are going to play within the rule book. Um, and that's, they don't want to waste somebody's time, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you could argue that a lot of that, it starts in childhood. You know, we do encourage girls to be um, quiet and speak when they're spoken to and be really polite. And we reward that behavior. Whereas we say things like, oh, well, boys will be boys, you know, as they jump off something they're not supposed to be jumping off. So those, those gender stereotypes can start at, you know, a very, um, a very young age. Um, but I think what I what I'm sort of keen to pick apart is this idea that it's the expectation and it's almost the default that um, flexible working is for working mothers, that we have a narrative as soon as you see a woman that's pregnant, you know, so people will ask, what, what are you going to do about work? Are you going to give work up? And we don't have those conversations with men. So there is a, an expectation or a burden that sits on the shoulders of, of females and working mothers it doesn't come into conversation with fathers in the same way. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I suppose is there there's probably some element here of it's sort of history repeating itself. You know, once upon a time it was it was a fair assumption that the woman was going to give up work uh, and the man was going to keep working, and that was how it was going to be. It's not that that was right. But that was certainly mm. what we saw for, for a large part of, uh, you know, sort of the more recent, I suppose, element of, of, of human history. Um, what's the sort of cause and effect here, really? Where's the, you know, what, what do we need to, to enact? Um, you know, uh, uh, what's the way through this? I, I think, you know, it's, it's very difficult to unpick uh, cultural expectations and, and sort of societal norms and, and suddenly replace them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's, I mean, there are many things that need to be addressed. And as you said, there's some systemic stuff, there's some societal things that are, you know, ingrained. I think it's really important to acknowledge that a problem exists and it's absolutely fascinating. I was doing a bit of research that shows that only 23% of Britons consider um, inequality between men and women as a serious problem. So I think sometimes we can we can get into a place where we think it's not a big a big deal. You know, we kind of accept it. Um, and I think that 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 I mean, that existed in my childhood. There was a message that it's just the way it is. You know, it, it just is the way men progress. Men make brilliant leaders. Women are the ones that have babies and stay at home. So I think acknowledging that we still have progress to make is absolutely kind of where we need to start so raising awareness around the statistics but also those anecdotal experiences that individuals have and shining a light on how difficult it is for somebody to be able to thrive at work to come back to work after parental leave um, and not just for women but for men as well so it's really challenging for lots of men to feel psychologically safe at work if they want to spend time with their children you know we don't make it easy for men to work flexibly to be the primary caregiver so for me there's something about the conversations that we're having at work the culture at work that removes gender from parenting so we take an approach where we look at parenting from a gender gender neutral angle so a lot of other countries are introducing uh, gender neutral uh, parental leave packages so and then and then non-transferable that also makes a massive difference so mm -hmm. they have more of a um, a use it or lose it approach which means all new fathers get a certain am amount of time off you know more than two weeks to be at home to understand um how much labor is involved in raising a small child to bond with their child and um, to break down those stereotypes in the workplace um, so there's definitely something at policy level which would be brilliant um, support from the government we we know that um, affordable child care is a massive enabler of um, female workforce participation um, but then also looking inside organizations at that psychological safety piece? Um, are there male role models that are parenting loudly, that are balancing their professions with parenthood as well? Um, 
And then also identifying that there is more support needed for those who are navigating that transition of leaving for a significant period of time and then reintegrating back into the workforce. Because those are the touch points that sometimes um, that's where we see the talent leaks. Interesting. And, and you, you mentioned sort of psychological safety on the way back into the workforce there between both both men and women. And, and quite rightly that these are kind of, um, you know, touch points from a business perspective. Of course, you know, we need policy change. We need cultural change. You know, But from a business perspective there, um, what what is the kind of crucial? Uh, I mean, I, 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 there's no silver bullet for anything. Right. But like it, what, what's the uh, the sort of big adjustment that the majority of companies need to make in that area in order to to get this sort of parental leave problem yeah that's a great question so i think that it's all about enabling line managers so policies are absolutely brilliant but if a policy isn't translated into practice then you're not going to see the benefits it's very easy to say to somebody oh we encourage you all to work flexibly But then in reality, somebody works flexibly and they don't quite feel safe logging off from their emails to go and pursue something else. So for me, it's about equipping the managers with um, the skills and the confidence to have better conversations with their team. Um, So parental leave and maternity leave can be one of those points in an employee or a team member's career that managers are actually afraid to have those conversations they're they're nervous particularly if it's the first time somebody on their team has announced a pregnancy and what then happens is because there's a nervousness they don't want to get it wrong they don't want to end up in an employment tribunal we then see inaction so they do nothing um which is then the problem so being able to have better conversations and have well-being conversations rather than just performance conversations, I think is a brilliant way to build that relationship between line manager and team member so that at every single point of their transition, they have they have that person that they can talk to. Um, they have their manager that they feel safe with and therefore they're able to ask for what they need in order to thrive at work um and 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 also they're able to give feedback to the organization they're able to say look i've just come back from parental leave you know i came back on a monday no one told me that monday everybody worked from home so i couldn't get into the building i didn't have an access card and i felt like a spare part but what actually happens is that because those individuals already have experienced a dip in confidence. Mm -hmm. They already feel like a burden because they haven't been there for nine months. They don't say those things. They don't provide the feedback to the organization Mm -hmm. to be able to do something to improve the culture. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think the other thing that's often sort of, um, you know, sort of spoke spoke about that. I mean, as you told that story, you know, I I, I smile. This is a, a, it's one of those stories, isn't it, that like 10 years down the line, you go, oh, yeah, God, do you remember that time and that happened to me? But actually in that moment, in that uh, situation of, you know, fear and worry about going back to the workplace, actually that, that really exacerbates the sort of psychological um, worry and, and, and situation that you're in. And that that alone could take, you know, weeks, if not months to mm-hmm. kind of get get past. Or am I just a spare wheel? Am I actually wanted back? Or am I just... Uh, you know, in in the way here because everything's moved on, and and even if the job hasn't, I mean, jobs obviously move on, work evolves. Um, even if you can catch up with that, maybe the conversation has moved on. You know, in, mm. the inside jokes have moved on. You're you're not you're now on the outside. Oh, do you remember that time when you know uh, Gary did that thing at the Christmas party? Well, actually, no, I don't because I was looking after my, my my child. I think you've touched on something really important there, which is um, this kind of idea of like belonging belonging and connection and when we look at the the workforce and how the needs of the workforce are changing and let's look at millennials because that age bracket tends to be the age bracket where you'll you'll see that employees are becoming their journey to become working parents what they seek from their organization is a greater sense of connection and belonging and when they are out of the workforce for nine months 12 months plus because they're on parental leave they feel very disconnected with what's going on they feel isolated they feel kind of out of sight out of mind and that can 
they're also sleep deprived most of the time. <laughs> and that can really, um, <clears throat> you know, play havoc on your relationship with your work and as you said like whether you feel like you're part of the team anymore and for many people it feels easier just to start from scratch again that's when the temptation at three o'clock in the morning when you're settling your child comes in I'll, I'll look on LinkedIn I'll see what's out there because actually maybe starting fresh is going to be easier um so when we look at what younger employees crave from work, connection and belonging is coming through um, as quite a strong message. And so I would always say to managers and organisations, how do you make sure that anybody who's going on parental leave still feels like a part of the team, even when they're not physically there? Yes, that's interesting. And and as you say, you know, when, when they come back because they didn't know what, you know, happened over at that at that. Christmas party. I think that's that's a really interesting um, sort of point there as well that you bring up, which is that you know the, a trend that we've seen in the in the world of work in a sort of macro sense is that it's much easier to go and find more jobs now. There are more mm. jobs and they're easier to apply for because you can do it online. And and actually, since the, the you know the pandemic, the idea of having a Zoom interview is totally normal as well. So um, you can do it in the evening. You can do it you know uh, whenever. Um, that new start is, you know, is an appealing uh, thing, of course, if you're if you're feeling that. And, and, you know, maybe you can even negotiate your way to, you know, maybe you'll look for a job that's four days a week or, you know, that allows you to finish earlier on certain days. So you can do, mm -hmm. do this. Thing. And so you then, you know, you can go and try and find the job that fits around your, uh, you know, your new new commitments rather than going in and saying, oh, I now want this. And they turn around and say, well, no, no, you get yeah. away anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that a job that can be agile with your needs is really important. So I think parental leave is an opportunity where most new parents will get the magnifying glass out, have a look at what's important for them. And it might be that their working pattern needs to be different, not always for a really long period of time, but it could just be for a short period of time. And so if, if they're current employer isn't necessarily agile and flexible then they are going to seek an organization that's more progressive with their thinking so absolutely that happens all the time I mean I think this is a move that we're, we're seeing uh, generally isn't it I, I wrote in a in an article recently that um, you know it, this this really is the time I think where we're going to see the next great divide between the companies that make it and the companies that don't and the companies who genuinely care about the people and the companies that don't if you if you don't genuinely care about your people, your people will recognise that because it's mm. fairly obvious. It's very difficult to fake genuine care. And so if those people get up and leave and go to the places where they're cared about, then all of a sudden that's where the talent goes. Oh, nearly took my headphones out. That's where all the talent uh, goes uh, uh, along the way. And so you... We're talking here, of course, a, you know, a very important sort of macro human issue, ultimately, about uh, sort of parenthood. But it's creating a, a sort of spark point uh, where this trend that's already happening can suddenly happen, you know, very, very quickly and quite predictably. I yeah. suppose the, the counter side of this is that if you are now a manager you know, not not quite knowing how to deal with someone coming back off parental leave. And you read a statistic, which is probably out there somewhere, which says 50% of people coming back off parental leave switch jobs within three months. You might sit there as a manager and say, well, I'm going to devote all my resources to the people who are not likely to leave. But of course, all you're doing there is just making the problem worse. Yeah. And, and I think it's like, but what if they all came back? You know, so it is, there's always going to be attrition at any point, any transition that any individual goes through. Everybody is going to have those moments where they reassess their priorities. But if you're fully committed to wanting to have um, better equity on your senior leadership um, board, if you want to have a truly inclusive and diverse organisation that has that benefit at the senior levels and hopefully you look at it beyond just a, a you know a bum on a seat and you think look how valuable it is for us to nurture and retain that talent and also I think it's a really interesting point that you raise there because 
you know, who's responsible for that attrition? So let's say we say 50% of new parents leave. I think well, we that... should probably point out that we've just made that up and that yeah. we, don't, we don't know the statistics. <laughs> Please don't quote us here. Let's stick with it. <laughs> but, but it's it works. really high, actually. So it's six, 60% of mothers will um, change careers within a couple of years of parental leave and 30% of dads. So it accelerates that kind of career change. Um or, or, as I said, they might not change career, but they might downshift. So they might not um, continue with their progression or they might reduce their hours when they don't really want to. Um, and we know that there can quite often be a penalty to not working full time if you want to um, progress it in your career. Um, and I just think that what we need to be looking at here is um, really nurturing the talents that those individuals bring. Um, because if you can pull them through, then it's not going to cost you as much. Mm -hmm. So well, I think we were saying that who's who's responsible. So £30,000 plus is how much it costs to replace lost talent. So it's going to hit the bottom line. But also as a manager, you're going to have a really... Um, it's going to be really disruptive for the rest of the team because you're then constantly having to find a replacement. You're having to integrate them into the team. That person might not stay beyond six months. Um, and it is that short term versus long term mindset. So absolutely, yes, there's always going to be change and transition at any life event happening for an individual. But it's about zooming out and looking at it longer term and more broadly across the whole organization um that would be my that would be my approach to it and and, and i've spent many years managing large teams you know i do i do not envy those that are in in the position where they're constantly balancing organizational demands and the needs of the individuals on their team it is a, an incredibly um fine line that so many of those managers are are having to kind of walk and the responsibilities that we now put on the shoulders of man managers is so much broader than it has been in the past so I, I do think it's a tricky role to be in. I mean I, I totally agree and I, I think you know one of the big uh, issues uh, with this is that we don't tend to have particularly good organisational alignment with the needs of people uh, and and I, I I hope I'm right in thinking that this is the shift that is that is happening. I'm certainly seeing it with people that I'm talking to, with people that I work with. You know, there's there's this kind of shift between. You know, we had um, James Fernandez on on here a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about uh, traditionally policy has been to kind of protect from the bottom five percent uh, of sort of issues and worries and concerns, but actually. The, you need to accept, OK, some of those things are going to happen and we need to kind of know what we're going to do there. But really, this policy should work for the majority of people. Like mm -hmm. it, it, the, the policy should be geared up for the for the majority, not for the the, the minority that you've, you've, you've got a problem with. And hopefully this kind of thinking um, helps to alleviate that, because at least the two sides of what the manager is looking at there is not so polar. Um, yeah. You know, we've got a little bit more, more bit more unity. And then, you know, maybe uh, at that point we start to see the organisation and the needs of the organisation start to focus more on saying, well, OK, actually, you know, we've, we've accepted that people are going to have children. I mean, we wouldn't be here unless that happened. So it's got to happen. So, um, you know, we then need to, to work out how we can how we can deal with this. Um, but I, I think I think it's also about shifting that mindset that it's not actually a disadvantage to have working parents on the team. So Ernst and Young did a big piece of research a while ago and um, uh, productivity research, and the most productive members of the workforce were females that were working on part time contracts, uh, working mothers uh, yeah. that were working on part time contracts, because they become ruthlessly efficient. You know, if you are doing something that is taking you away from your little bundle of joy, you you become ruthlessly efficient. You know what to say yes to. You know what to say no to. You also, if you work in a um, consumer facing industry, you know eighty six percent of household decisions are made by women. So if you haven't got women on the board understanding the behaviours of their consumers, you're going to find that you're at a massive disadvantage. So I think there's something about you know not just looking at parental leave and working parents as this burden and this thing that we need to be 
coping with and accepting but actually seeing it as a significant advantage and the benefit that it brings to the organization as well uh, yeah you're spot on there and i you know i suppose i even myself sort of fall fully uh of of that kind of feeling that it's burdenous exactly what i just said there and you're totally right to to, to correct me that actually that there's there's an awful lot of, of of benefit to this in in all ways. I certainly uh, agree with what you're saying about having sort of women on the board. I'm I'm, I'm very grateful uh, and lucky that I grew up with the mum that I that I did, uh, who was uh, very successful in in business in her own right. And and she is a strong believer that you know you can't have an efficient team without um, both men and women on it. Um, you know if you put too many men in a room. Uh, and ask them to make decisions, bad things happen. If you put too many women in a room and ask them to make decisions, bad things happen. And actually, let's just get everyone in the room. And, yeah. and especially if your consumers, um, you know, are women or even 50% women, you know, maybe maybe it's just the, the demographic of the world. You know, it's this, this, set, this argument extrapolates out beyond men and women into um, ethnicity, to uh, gender identity, to sexuality, to every other uh, characteristic that we can, you know, background, education, um, religion, you know, the more diverse the team becomes and the more accepting we become of people's differences, uh, the, the greater we can uh, can expect our sort of output and alignment with, with the world uh, yeah. to, to be. And, and I think it's about understanding that we're on a journey to achieve that. And it, that, as you said, there isn't a silver bullet and it, it might not feel easy, but always taking the easy route and expecting those quick wins such as, oh, that person wants to come back to work. They only want to work part-time. We really need someone full-time. Let's just recruit somebody that can work full-time. That short-term mindset will trip organizations up that don't take that more uh, long-term su sustainable view. Um, and I'm really seeing that. I'm really seeing those organizations that are saying, actually, do you know what? We do quite a good job, but we want to do a better job. We want to make sure that we don't get to a point where, we are in remedial mode because something's gone significantly wrong. Mm -hmm. well, I think we, we as business people and, and, and the world of business generally spends quite a lot of time being reactive, doesn't it? And, and seeing, you know, oh, this thing's happened. Now we're in a position to, you know, maybe we've got experience, you know, we've been put in this sort of position of authority to turn around and go, well, given this thing happened, we're now going to do this. But actually, mm -hmm. yeah, being, being more long term uh, there is, is, is applicable to a lot of areas of business. I think I think menopause is probably a really good example of, of what's happened in the last sort of three years that suddenly become, you know, on the agenda for quite a lot of organisations that didn't necessarily talk about menopause. And there's a little bit of a knee jerk reaction to it, you know, because they're sort of looking over their shoulders, seeing that their competitors are doing something. Um, but if it is just a sticky plaster, if it is just a tick box exercise, then as you said, you're not going to get those sustainable results. You're not going to see the benefits from it longer term. So it's got to be uh, a more strategic intervention that takes that big picture into account. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Look, I'm I'm keen to move on to the uh, to the second question now. I think we've you know we've been talking a lot about sort of more long term thinking, so I think this will this will tie in quite nicely. But let's let's imagine for a moment that we've managed to to sort of fix these these problems these problems with regards to um, parental pay gaps, uh, gender pay gaps, um, underrepresentation of particularly women in in the workplace, but the, the broader sort of diversity spectrum uh, also, uh, etc. Let's we, we've magically fixed it. What can we look forward to? What, what should we be trying to, gosh, if I phone me, it was that easy, right? Um, Absolutely. I'll get my wand out. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, what, what would we be looking forward to? So I'm really looking forward to um, the younger generations not having the dilemma of picking between their professional career and whether they want to become a parent or not. So at the moment, I'm going backwards, but I will go forwards. <laughs> uh, you know, there are girls, women, men in their early 20s that are starting to ask themselves those questions. Shall I go for this job? Shall I go for promotion or shall I have a family? So in the future, for me, those two things are not mutually exclusive, but they work together. Um, we have a future where there aren't recruitment biases. So we see anybody of any gender, any age being given a fair opportunity at interview and through the recruitment process um, where we see 
more men who want to be present fathers being able to take that time off um not really time off but let's say time away from paid work <laughs> to be with their children without without the um discrimination that they can experience in the workplace um so a much fairer more equal more equitable space for both men and women to choose so for me it's very much about choice it's about those individuals being able to choose what's right for them rather than falling into this category of like it's just default because you earn less because you are the biological mother you will default to having a career break and therefore you know triggering off all the disadvantages that come as a result of that I think that's that's very interesting, powerful. The thing that I, I sort of come keep coming back to in my mind is is what you said that you know so it feels a bit of a revolution uh, to me, uh, which I, I sort of slightly embarrassed to admit. But it's it's this idea that actually there's there's a positive to this. This is not just we need to accept the human condition uh, in order to uh, sort of progress because that's good for society. There's actually a, like a business uh, advantage here if you can get the right people, uh, you know, with the right set of um, learned experiences, as, as you, you know, you gave a, a, a really vivid example there of a, you know, a woman who's now very, very good at knowing when to say yes and no, because they're, they're, they're so efficient, because they have to be, they have no choice uh, other than to be in, in, in their life. And actually by harnessing these skills and looking for the, the sort of makeup and dynamic of the, of the team, either on a small uh, micro team level or a macro organizational level, then that's, that's the powerful uh, kind of element that we could, we could potentially look forward to here. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think you also touched upon this kind of leadership style as well. So too much of one thing is never going to be the most effective or efficient, is it? And I think, you know, bringing more of those feminine leadership traits into those decision making roles. We we know that women bring more transformational leadership traits to the team. It's going to um, better match the needs of the younger generations who want an organisation that cares about them as a person, who wants an organisation that's committed to uh, charity to social commitments to purpose and and that again is something that could be advanced by having more women in those roles absolutely and we we're already seeing i mean uh, you know there's plenty of arguments about esg and and the the kind of validity of it but we are definitely seeing statistics that show that companies that um focus on esg and and, and make esg uh part of their uh, sort of code of of, of uh, you know, how how they how they operate. Uh, they they're seeing advantages. And so if we if we can create this kind of more equitable uh, group, where as you say we we have time to be more active in the community society, uh, you know, more more inclusive, then then this it, it seems should should bring around positive uh, sort of change to to sort of maybe more traditional business goals such as profit and bottom line and all of those words that uh, <laughs> yeah. accountants talk about and we nod <laughs> yeah absolutely it will it will bring about loads of competitive advantage absolutely I think that's that's a really interesting uh, uh, sort of discussion that we've we've had today. Um, you know, I think we've we've gone through uh, obviously this kind of burning uh, issue with regards to sort of parenthood and motherhood and what that looks like. Um, looking at the the kind of touch points and the and the way that they uh, exacerbate other systemic issues that we have in, in in the workplace. I think it's been 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 really interesting. I think this idea of um, you know the, the more the more diverse and inclusive our workplace is. Uh, the, the the better in in so many metrics I think and and really that's the sort of core of of this isn't it that um, you know we need to be accepting of uh, other people give choice give you know I suppose to some degree accept that work is not everything uh, you know yeah. there is more to life uh, than than the desk you sit at every day. Yeah, and my final thought there as well is that, um, you know, we develop skills outside of the workplace as well. So, you know, we think about all of those skills that are developed um, when you're not sitting at a desk in a, in a workplace, negotiation, resilience, project management. Again, those are the sorts of things that get developed or really fine tuned uh, on parental leave that bring, you, you know, if you bring your new parents back, you're bringing back like, 
they've been on a, an intensive boot camp, right? It's like going on a skills boot camp for nine months that no employee sitting at their desk for nine months doing the same thing day in, day out is going to have had that exposure to learning. So it's a massive advantage, which so often goes untapped. Absolutely. What a powerful uh, message to finish on uh, there, Lizzie. It's been absolutely fantastic uh, to have you here. Uh, what a brilliant uh, discussion. Um, really so grateful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fraser. Cheers.